Good evening and welcome to Public Eye. For a nation of animal lovers, we've long remained detached about some of the more controversial ways in which they've been used. Toiletries and cosmetics have seldom been associated with the animals on which they're tested, and advances in medical science were rarely perceived to be the result of experiments on living creatures. But those days are gone. Animal rights are now an issue on the agenda, forced there not just by respectable campaigning groups, but by extremists who burn fleets of meat lorries, threaten innocent families, and send letter bombs. The recent scare over Lucasade is but a fleeting glimpse of their underreported and growing campaign. They call themselves the Animal Liberation Front, the ALF, and Britain's medical scientists and researchers are a prime target. They profess that theirs is a non-violent campaign, but the evidence suggests otherwise. And the campaign has had some effect, driving some scientists into exile abroad and others into silence at home. They're reluctant to raise their voice in defense of animal research and the medical benefits that are its fruit. Such is the fear amongst those targeted by the ALF that few are prepared to speak openly on camera. Tonight, Mike Embley investigates the darker side of animal rights activity in Britain and the hidden human cost of what the ALF calls its campaign of economic sabotage. This is Northern Ireland. The images may look familiar. Pubs gutted by fire. Farm buildings and machinery burned out by arsonists. A score of attacks on businesses and clubs. Well-tried tactics, but in an unlikely cause. Arson for animals. All this is claimed by the Animal Liberation Front. At first, of course, we thought it was the paramilitaries. Uh, it was several different types of paramilitaries in Northern Ireland. And that's what we real thought it was at the start. Uh, somebody getting back at me because I was a unionist councillor. But Stanley McCoy's butcher's shop in Newtonards, east of Belfast, was burned out with two incendiary devices by the ALF. A butcher for ten years, he was also a vocal supporter of the local hunt. Either may have cost him his livelihood. I broke down in tears uh, and cried uh, when this premises went up. Uh, it was a Saturday night and I said to myself, what am I going to do with myself on Monday? Has it stopped here or has there been more since? Well, no, it hasn't stopped. No, really. You get telephone calls to the house. My children don't answer the telephone anymore. For the reason is that they asked my daughter, who is 10 years of age, my address. Somebody rang your house? They rang my house. And I don't feel that my children were safe. And actually, I'm thinking about moving the house as well. For his part in promoting field sports, this man's home north of Belfast has been under siege for three years. John Beach is careful where he takes his walks. He checks beneath his car every day. The post brings him razor blades hidden in envelopes. Telephone callers tell him he's on an ALF hit list. It started with uh, telephone calls, uh, much abuse, uh, telephone calls every 20 minutes throughout the night, telephone calls to my colleagues at work who uh, were being abused, uh, who were uh, being threatened, uh, and on couple of occasions with death threats because they were involved with me. You can be as strong as you like, but after a while, when this has been going on for months and months and months, you do actually begin to think, well, I wonder what is going to happen, and I wonder what is going to happen to my family, what is going to happen to, to my colleagues at work when these threats are continuous. How would you describe what's been going on against you? In my view, they are terrorists. Because they cause terror? Absolutely. Terrorists of a particularly unpleasant kind, too. The masks, the whole image of the paramilitary, is not new to the ALF. More disturbing in this spread from a Belfast tabloid is the parading of weapons. Public Eye's own inquiries suggest the claims about high explosive are untrue. But in the context of Northern Ireland, the message is unmistakable. Intimidation, severe and personal. Four men and a woman have been arrested here under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. Ten people may eventually face trial in connection with a string of incidents all claimed on behalf of the Animal Liberation Front. The charges include arson with intent to endanger life. They follow an operation by the Royal Ulster Constabulary which was considerable even by the standards of Northern Ireland. 
Working on the case were 55 detectives from a specialist anti-terrorist surveillance squad. Throughout Britain, the Animal Liberation Front is now more active than ever before, causing millions of pounds worth of damage. Police list 400 attacks with incendiaries since the mid-1980s, a hundred in just the first six months of this year. In one night, a meat company in the Midlands loses nine lorries and up to a hundred thousand pounds. Nine more incendiaries fail to ignite. Threats of contamination remove every bottle of Lucasade from the country's shelves. The cost, five million pounds. The target, parent company SmithKline Beecham Pharmaceuticals. Up to 70 attacks a month on Boots the chemist for Boots Pharmaceuticals part in testing drugs on dogs. They have been enormously effective. They are doing far more economic damage to this country than the IRA. And by and large, a lot of this economic damage is going unreported. It's going unreported because the targets are worried that if the level is actually known, is actually publicised, then it will just add to their problems. This is the activist manual that primes the ALF's latest incendiary campaign. Roughly photocopied, widely distributed, it's a handbook for sabotage. How to make timed incendiaries and petrol bombs. How best to damage vehicles, locks and phone lines. How to handle the media, the home numbers and addresses of field sports organisers. The impact of ALF incendiaries became clear eight years ago in the campaign against the fur trade. Devices supposed to ruin stock by setting off sprinklers destroyed several stores. A proud boast in ALF promotional videos. It would be naive to presume that large companies would be persuaded by compassionate arguments. They sell fur to make money. They will only stop when it is unprofitable. These actions made it that way, and the stores pulled out of the fur trade. Brendan McNally was one of a dozen activists in prison for their part in the incendiary campaign against fur. You plant a device of any kind, you accept the risk of injury, possibly even death. Well, it must be there. A device, if a device is planted, it's, it's planted to, to, to damage property. Yes, and but property there's always a risk that rights. people will come into contact. There are people in that property. Yeah, but most, I mean, the devices which I've come into contact with have been devices which, have, as far as we've been concerned uh, in the past, that is, um, have carried no risk to human or animal life. People have been very careful and in fact all the Animal Liberation Front activists I've ever met or worked with have, have had the same philosophy. ALF publicity stresses the philosophy of non-violent direct action, removing animals, destroying the property and profits of alleged abusers. But its lack of structure means in effect that anything is possible and everything deniable. The ALF is not an organisation in the same way that you might talk about the IRA, the UVF. There is no central army command council, if you like. The ALF is, because of its anarchist origins, very disparate. If you or I wanted to become a cell of the ALF, all we'd have to do is start taking ALF-type actions, uh, ringing up the local newspaper and saying, we firebombed a, a farmer's house or whatever, uh, and then let the ALF central post office know what we've done so it doesn't have a membership as such yet activists acknowledge the writings of alf founder ronnie lee are still the closest thing to policy lee is serving 10 years for conspiracy but he's hoping for parole next year and his statements from jail have been carefully phrased this from two years before he went inside is more explicit Animal liberation is not a hobby or a part-time pastime but a fierce struggle that demands total commitment if the animals are ever to be free. There will be injuries and possibly deaths on both sides before our ultimate victory for animal liberation is achieved. This is sad but certain. These were bombs. Police are sure they were intended to kill. The targets fit the ALF profile. Bristol University, a scientist's car. ALF say they don't use high explosive and they didn't do this. The office diary of another so-called legitimate target, a charity shop raising funds for animal research. Four months ago, a packet incendiary left overnight in the letterbox was opened here by a volunteer worker, a possibility those who left it must have foreseen. It was claimed on behalf of the ALF. This is just the damage that remains. I tried to get it out that way towards me, and it wouldn't come. So I turned it round, and I opened it that way, there was a big flash and something went up the wall and the next thing I looked at was all fire on the desk. 
Had I have opened it the other way, I got my hair down, which was long, it would have gone right into my face. It would have burnt my hair. It would have burnt my face as well, so it would have been very, very dangerous. If no good asking for animal liberation, they're not going to hand it to us. We've all, when we leave here, in our own way, we've got to go out and take it. The ALF's public spokesman calls explicitly for direct action. But letter bombs, he says, like car bombs, are not ALF policy. They're part of a conspiracy. Anyone can pick up a telephone. It could have been the chief constable of XYZ picking up the telephone and saying, I'm from the Animal Liberation Front. It's one area that the ALF has a problem in. Now they have, again, an official press officer. I hope that smears like that won't be so easy to perpetrate. But then, if things happen that you don't feel you should admit to, all you have to say is, well, I'm sorry it happened, but it's outside our policy. No, it's quite simple. The ALF has a policy, and I either say it is within or without it. I have no power to say, um, to change the policy. It's up to the activists who have laid down the policy in the past, and there is no reason to change it. But you can see how activists who are fiercely committed to what they think is policy could do almost anything. Well, it's up to an individual what they do. I'm not promoting or inciting them to do it, anything. If an individual carried out an action which was outside ALF policy, it's up to them in whichever manner they wish to claim it. Um, I wouldn't necessarily condone that action on behalf of the ALF. I would, however, be prepared to understand how they've been driven to such an action by the sheer horror and scale of the suffering that's played on their mind. Would you condemn it? I don't think... I'm in a position to condemn anyone whose mind has been so troubled by what they've learnt of how our species tr treat the other animals in this world. I can't condemn them. The passions that turn animal liberation to violence are at their most ferocious on the issue of animal experimentation, vivisection. The campaign against this kind of medical research goes far beyond removing animals from labs like this bombs under cars, labs burned to the ground. And it's a conflict with no end in sight because feelings run high on both sides. Many scientists say they cannot do their work without working on animals. Professor Sir Roy Khan paints portraits of his patients. It's only his hobby. He's better known worldwide as a pioneer of transplant surgery, especially for children. Hello, Tamara. You can eat those baked beans. They're good for your new liver. His techniques, all developed on animals, could save Tamara's life. It's her third time, and I hope it's third time lucky. She's really been through it. Poor little Tamara. She'll have to get her top knot hairstyle again, because I like that. But there's been an attempt on his life. Oh, she's doing well. Keep it up. I was sent a bomb, uh, personally. Uh, the staff, the young, particularly the young staff, have been very frightened by raids on the animal uh, laboratories. Whenever these people steal dogs that have had transplants or pigs that have had transplants, they make uh, a child like Tamara more likely to suffer because it means that they're more likely to reject because they're holding back developments in drugs. So maybe those who support them should think about that a little bit. Is that really what they want? New drugs will decide Andrew Hardwick's right. future. How are you? All right, thank you. You just come up for a check. Now ten, he was given a new liver at the same time as Ben Hardwick, Britain's best-known transplant patient. It's seven and a half years, is it? Yeah. Ben died. Andrew has survived longer than anyone. Not very many pills now. No. Two a day, sir. His father calls him the living proof. Give my love to your dog. Thank you. Sir Roy Carr said he would look at Andrew. We brought him down. He said he would see what he could do for him. And thankfully, that he did something for him due to the work he's done. And without him, well, all this board here now wouldn't be here, but for the work that always done. Have you been actively considering at any stage whether it can be done without animal experimentation? Well, some things one can do tissue culture experiments, one can do chemical reactions, and these are always done when they can. They're far easier to do, they're far cheaper, 
And they're also, um, it's much more satisfactory because nobody that I know working experimentally with animals uh, enjoys doing it for the sake of the experiments on the animals, but they feel it's a necessity. Those experiments put laboratory staff in the front line. There have been two raids here at Cambridge to remove animals in the past five months alone. The second raid occurred after lunch. One afternoon, 30 people with cameras and video cameras who knew exactly where they were going, who were there to photograph, um, not to bother the staff as such, but they did take some dogs while they were in the building. What does it feel like living in this kind of atmosphere? Well, it's not very pleasant. It's um, the equivalent, really, of being burgled. But on the other hand, when your home is burgled, you're not usually there. So, in other ways, it's more personal because they, they came in when you are there. The words of the chant of violence, the mood of the march, is militant. There's impatience here for change. This is animal rights on the move in Sheffield last month under the banners of the National Anti-Vivisection Society. Direct action for animals is much in favour here. The ALF are good and I support what they do because um, I don't think the animals should be left in laboratories. So if they, if they want to get them out, then they can. They've got my whole support. As far as the violence goes, I'm not for the violence. But as, as far as economic sabotage goes, you know, smashing labs, because that's the only way we can get the information. Well, unfortunately, people want to see an end to it now, overnight. People haven't got the patience to wait because it will end. It will end through public pressure. Animal rights is something very different from the idea of animal welfare, which is what we were all brought up on, the love of animals, a sense of human beings having duties towards animals. Animal rights suggests that animal rights are equal to those of human rights. They're a parallel, separate, but equal set of rights that animals should enjoy and therefore that all species um, enjoy equal rights under the natural law. What has happened in the last 10 years is that, by and large, the philosophy of animal rights has overtaken uh, beliefs in animal welfare amongst the rank and file of people who belong to mainstream groups. This injection will give this mouse bowel cancer. It's been specially bred to develop human cancer cells. 18,000 like it are experimented on each year in the search for a cancer vaccine. Rodents make up more than 80% of the 3 million animals used each year in Britain. In the past 10 years of animal rights activism, numbers have dropped by more than a million. Britain's laboratory laws are now the most restrictive in the world. But many mainstream anti-vivisection campaigners, outspoken too against violence, feel no concession short of abolition is enough. I came to realize that on ethical grounds, it wasn't justifiable for us to do to animals what we wouldn't do to human beings because animals suffer pain and distress in the same ways that we do. How much of your objection to all this is purely scientific? The main problem is the problem of species differences, which not only means that if you want to test a new drug or a new process on an animal, the way a rat or a rabbit responds may be quite different to the way your human patient will respond, but also because most laboratory animals don't tend to suffer from the major killing diseases that humans suffer from, Scientists create these conditions in animals artificially and while this may lead them to find out some aspects of the disease process, the cause of disease in the human organism is likely to be quite different and so it can mislead as to the nature of the human illness. But a legitimate scientific debate is being stifled by intimidation. To some, Professor Colin Blakemore is a torturer. He's a rare public defender of the use of animals in medical research. His willingness to discuss his work has brought him death threats. And his university, this year alone, two incendiary attacks and raids which removed 300 animals. What do you do to cats and monkeys? You've been particularly attacked for sewing up the eyes of kittens. Is it true? Yes, some of the work involves depriving animals of vision. And the, the easiest... Um, and I think in many ways the least stressful way of doing that is simply to close the eyes, close the eyelids. To stitch them closed? Yes, to stitch them closed. Um, stitching the eyelids closed is a surgical procedure which is used fairly frequently by ophthalmologists, even in children, to protect the eye if it's damaged. So it's a standard surgical procedure which 
appears to cause very little distress, even to babies or young children that have it done to them. It's a very innocuous procedure. It sounds, of course, absolutely horrendous. The crucial application, says Colin Blakemore, is to child blindness, preventing the condition lazy eye, which can rarely be treated. He believes he's established why, when and where it occurs. His work involves four or five animals a year, but he says ALF raids have set it back years and turned his home into a fortress. He's the most targeted scientist in the world. Do you feel that you and your staff and your family are actually in danger? Yes, I do, and I think that uh, it would be very foolish not to make that assumption. And that's for keeps now, is it? It's going to go on. Well, I mean, when, uh, when the police tell you that you should live your life uh, assuming that there's a gunman around every corner, and that's happened to me, then I have to make the assumption that it's for life. There's been a very personal campaign against Colin Blakemore. How far is that likely to go? Well, I uh, take exceptions to threatening his life or his family. It's his property, which is, a, which, is which, in animal liberation philosophy, is a, is a legitimate target. I don't really think that uh, he, hey, he's, he's as well-meaning as you make out. I think he's a very evil person. I think anybody who can do that to animals must get some enjoyment out of it to do it day in, day out. There are people out there, clearly, who feel very strongly indeed against the work that you do. Some few people who may feel strongly enough to want to kill you for it. Has that not made you re-examine what you do? But to suggest that, that, that a scientist involved in working with animals is not constantly examining and re-examining the basis of the, their ethical judgment, I think is an insult. Uh, no one's in this game without having thought through at great length the, the, their moral position. If you could have known the kind of pressures this work would bring, would you ever have started out on it? To be absolutely frank, if I had known that I would personally be targeted in the way that I have, I don't think I would. Vivisection may already have lost the argument with the next generation. At Graveney School in South London, animal rights are a frequent set topic for discussion. These 13 and 14 year olds were drawn at random. You've said some of you are vegetarians, some of you, or most of you, I think, buy cruelty-free products. But how far would any of you go beyond that? Mary? I would like to go up to the actual scientists and try to get it through to them what they're doing is wrong. And that the, the majority of the population does not like it at all. Does anybody feel that we haven't or we have had enough information from scientists about why animal testing has to be done? I think that this kind of thing actually tells people enough what they need to know. I mean, it explains what they test the animals for, and it explains how they do it. And I think that if the scientists really wanted to get their point across that badly, then uh, they would actually put things forward, like leaflets like this, and put organisations explaining. We have the evidence. We put together our facts. Our case is strong. Animal experiments don't work, and the law cannot work. Jan Creamer heads the National Anti-Vivisection Society, one of the wealthiest animal rights groups. It supplies tens of thousands of information packs to schools like Graveney. The case for animal experimentation, she says, is non-existent. It hasn't achieved anything and it doesn't work. And uh, our opposition are very fond of listing whole hosts of uh, so-called medical progress, which they claim for themselves at the expense of clinicians who've worked with people. Do you have the medical expertise and the scientific knowledge to make these judgments? Yes, we have our own library. We've looked at the scientists' papers. We can translate the medical jargon. After the NAVS rally in Sheffield, an exhibition with many stalls, a large selection of ALF merchandise at one of them. The NAVS has published material from raids by Liberation Front activists in its own magazines. Do you pay for the materials that you use, I mean, materials taken from laboratories and research establishments? Um, we tend to... Um, oh, let's stop there. The question was, do you pay for the material that you publish from the ALF? I ask the question because that is obviously a clear way of supporting their activity, if indeed you do that. Mm. Do you want to say it again? I'd be grateful if you'd answer the question. You, then you want to ask me the question again? Do you pay for material I'm illegally obtained? I'm only asking obtained? for a prompt. Do you pay for material illegally obtained by the ALF and published in your publication? 
We have done uh, paid for material in the past uh, for photographs and things like this. You paid five thousand pounds at one time to the Central Animal Liberation League. That was for the purchase of uh, photographs and uh, uh, copies of information. And for example, with the investigations uh, that we do now, I mean, obviously, we have to fund um, a, an investigation of that kind. Um, as far as we're concerned, this is uh, the way that if there's some, if this is the way that we get information. If some information is available, then we're always um, looking for more information on animal experimentation. Even though you must be aware that money will be used to fund illegal activities. No, I don't think that uh, this is uh, our concern. What uh, we do, in the same way as other organisations do, is we constantly look for uh, information for, from laboratories, and uh, if it's available, then uh, we take it. Since we recorded that interview, Jan Kremer has sent public eye a statement. She says, NAVS opposes all violence to humans and animals. It supports non-violent direct action. The bulk of the material we receive is freely donated to our cause. We have never and would never fund illegal activities. NAVS in no way supports or approves of the activities of extremist groups and deplores any illegal action which may threaten the well-being of the general public. All the so-called terrorists I know are the really compassionate people and I'm proud to stand here and say that I'm a friend of Ronnie Lee. At the same rally in Sheffield, Robin Webb, RSPCA council member, names his ALF heroes. And everyone else who has been in jail, who is in jail, and will go to jail for the animals. They are the heroes of the movement. They are the heroes for the animals. Robin Webb was advocating direct action in an ALF magazine a year ago. The 12 members of the RSPCA council will consider his future next month. I believe a considerable number of the council members are out of touch with the latter part of the 20th century. How many more people within the RSPCA council sympathise directly with you? It's hard to tell. Um, immediately, I would say at least half a dozen. Um, general sympathies, probably many more. Clearly Mr Webb will explain his views when he gets that opportunity before our council and it will then be for them to decide what should be done. What do you expect to happen to him? I think it would be inappropriate for me to speculate on that. They're intelligent people, they'll come to their own conclusions. But it must have been quite clear for around a year at the very least that there were people within your organisation who wanted to take a much more militant stance, quite against your regulation. There may well be people within the organisation who have differing views, so those are the mainstream of the RSPCA. But the RSPCA's politics and policies have always been overtly clear. Now, if those individuals disagree with them, they may seek to change them. They won't, uh, and they certainly won't move the RSPCA away from a position of uh, seeking to attain the best for all animals on our planet, all our fellow creatures, by all lawful means. Many have already moved well beyond lawful means, some beyond any definition of non-violent direct action. Anti-terrorist law has been invoked in Northern Ireland. Some say the ALF should actually be banned. What worries me about the ALF is that they are totally irresponsible. And I believe that innocent lives will eventually be lost as a result of the activities of the LF. And that's why I'm anxious that they should be prescribed, because I think they're in many ways more dangerous than some of the terrorist organizations that are prescribed. And if they are prescribed, what will that mean? Well, it would mean, firstly, it strengthens the powers of the security forces to act against them. And secondly, insofar as those who have been damaged or hurt by the LF, it improves their chances of getting proper and fair compensation. But a movement with no membership is a hard target for the law to hit. All the more so when the public face of animal extremism, so-called non-violent direct action, has such widespread emotional appeal. Scientists and others caught up in this face a dilemma. Speak out and risk violence. Stay silent and lose the debate by default. It's a choice made all the harder by the single-mindedness of those who oppose them. Mike Embley reporting on the human cost of the ALF's often violent campaign and the suffering of those caught up in it. Next week, Jenny Cuff reveals a disturbing pattern of sexual abuse amongst young mentally handicapped adults and why the courts seem unable to punish the perpetrators. Until next Friday, a very good night.